welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe in the studios for our flagship stations, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, today, as always, we're on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Both of our television stations are on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99 in the Greater West Bloomfield and the Birmingham Bloomfield area. But if you don't have Comcast or AT&T or you don't live in those particular areas, you can always watch us online, civiccentertv.com. Just click on our Watch Live link at the top of our homepage or view, view us in the small player on the top right of the page. It's always there on our homepage at civiccentertv.com. We're also on MyMichiganTV, MyMITV.com. You can learn more about Michigan's streaming network as My Michigan TV is on your smartphone, on your smart TV, and online, MyMI. TV.com. And we're on Facebook each day via Facebook Live. Facebook.com slash Civic Center TV 15 and Facebook.com slash Lakes FM. And if you ever miss an episode of the Megacast or you want to learn more about our many, many partnering television, radio, and other media outlets, you can find all that information as well as our full episodes and each and every interview from our program Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon on our website at civiccentertv.com slash Megacast. There you go. You can, if you go to that website, you want to learn more about Lakes FM, we have a link to the Lakes FM website. Website. We have a link to the Biff's website, and if you uh, want to learn more about my 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 Michigan TV mymitv.com, uh, you can click on a direct link to that web page right here on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And if you just want to listen to certain interviews from each and every one of our shows, instead of the full the full two hour long episode, you can find individual interviews by clicking on watch full interviews. Or if you can't tune in live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon and 1.30 p.m. is your time of day of choice to listen and watch to the Megacast, you can watch full episodes on our website by clicking on Watch Full Episodes at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And then on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, we have links to helpful information from the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, as well as Oakland County about COVID-19, as well as helpful links to uh, local municipalities in the Oakland County area and their direct COVID-19 informational pages. They'll give you information about how COVID-19 is affecting your hometown, the, your county, as well as the state and at the federal level. And in, critical information about vaccines, about mask wearing, about the Delta variant and other variants that are continuing to pop up uh, worldwide and will eventually, presumably, be affecting us here in the state of Michigan. And we have links to articles that are making headlines each and every day. And today's top story on our website at civiccentertv.com, Michigan confirms 4,326 COVID-19 cases and, thir and 38 additional deaths over the past two days. The Michigan public health officials confirmed those, ca those additional cases on Wednesday. This article from the Oakland Press. The, those cumulative totals represent test data collected Tuesday and Wednesday. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services publishes new case, death, and vaccination numbers every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Of the 38 deaths, 10 were identified during a vital records review. Over the past two days, the state has averaged 2,163 cases per day, up from 1,273 cases per day from August 21st through 23rd, a 69.6% increase. A two-day case total brought the state's total confirmed cases and deaths to 937,720 and 20,161 since the onset of the pandemic. Oakland County saw the largest increase in cases at 619, followed by Wayne County at 573, excluding Detroit, Macomb County at 383, Kent County at 288, and Ottawa County at 187. Detroit, which is counted separately, from Wayne County had an increase of 220 cases. 26 of the state's 83 counties reported at least one new death as well, according to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services data. The state's COVID-19 cases and test positivity rates continue to remain high due to the spread of the Delta variant. Statewide, there are over 1,120 Michiganders hospitalized with COVID-19, the majority being in Southeast Michigan, with 76% of the state's hospital beds occupied. Michigan's daily case rate currently stands at 125 and a half cases per 100,000 residents, which puts the state in high community transmission category. The testing 
positivity rate is averaging about 8 to 10 percent per day and getting into that low or little spread of community spread of community spread uh, area is about 3 percent or under so we are more than triple that right now as we are hovering around 8 to 10 percent across the state of Michigan. The CDC is reporting that 92.98% of U.S. counties have had high community transmission levels, including the majority of Michigan's 83 counties. High transmission means an average of at least 100 cases per day per 100,000 residents over a seven-day period. According to Michigan's public health officials, most of the state's 83 new virus outbreaks are concentrated in the long-term care those being 26 new outbreaks there, and child care settings with 18 new outbreaks. As of August 25th, the state's vaccination coverage rates for residents 16 and older was over 65%, including 36.2% for those ages 12 to 15, 44.7% for those ages 16 to 19, 42.7% for those 20 to 29, and 53% for those ages 30 to 39. On Wednesday, Governor Whitmer issued an executive directive to, to state departments and agencies to begin preparing the state's vaccine response to administer booster COVID-19 vaccine doses to Michiganders beginning on September 20th. Whitmer added that Michigan, quote, has an ample supply of COVID-19 vaccine to meet the projected demand. In the directive, Whitmer also directed the state's vaccine providers to, provi to prioritize booster doses beginning with residents in long-term care facilities, including nursing homes and adult foster care facilities. In a quote from Governor Whitmer, with the, boost, with the booster doses on the horizon, we are reactivating our close partnerships with local health departments and pharmacies to get shots in arms as quickly as possible. She continued, we know that this virus still disproportionately affects older Michiganders, which is why I am also prioritizing booster shots for residents in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Lynn Sutfin, a spokesperson from the Health and Human Services Department, confirmed Wednesday that 9,010 booster doses have been administered since August 13th statewide. Right now, the only groups eligible for a third dose include those the federal government identifies as immunocompromised, such as organ transplant, don organ transplant uh, patients, active cancer and HIV patients, and uh, at least six months out from their two-dose series. Sutfin said updated third-dose numbers should be added to the state's website on Friday. So uh, the state taking a little bit more serious of an approach to vaccine boosters for the immunocompromised as we continue to see case rates across the state of Michigan uh, continue to rise. We, we, so we see the case, uh, the daily case numbers now are uh, in the high thousands or early two thousands over the last three day period. We've had over 2,000 cases of COVID-19, which is significantly up from the previous three day period uh, that was recorded. Also making headlines on civiccentertv.com, almost half of Michigan students are now in schools with COVID mask mandates. This article from Bridge Michigan Magazine. Even without a statewide school mask mandate, a rising number of Michigan districts are requiring facial coverings when classes open, either of their own choice or through orders from county health departments, such as what's, what's happened here in Oakland County. As of Tuesday night, at least 153 of the state's 537 traditional school districts enrolling about 660,000 students, 46% of all public schools in Michigan, had mask mandates, according to figures tabulated by the administration of Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Not all of those 624,000 students will be required to wear masks. In some of the 153 districts, for instance, only elementary school students who are not yet eligible for vaccination will face a mask mandate, while others uh, while in others, all students must wear facial coverings. Mask mandates have skyrocketed in the past week as Delta variant-fueled cases continue to rise. A number of children in some areas are being hospitalized, and with the federal government granting full approval to the vaccine produced by Pfizer, uh, the Health Division of Oakland County issued a mask mandate for all schools in the state's second most populous county on Tuesday evening. The order co covers the 28 public school districts in the county as well as charter schools. The order requires all staff and students from, from pre-K through 12th grade to wear facial coverings while in school regardless of vaccination status and stays in effect until 14 days after the community transmission in the county is lowered to moderate 
from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Oakland County is currently categorized by the CDC as having, a, as having high transmission. Most counties in the state are also categorized as either substantial or high transmission, both considered worse for COVID-19 spread than moderate. Oakland is at least the sixth county to issue a mask mandate for schools following Genesee, Kent, Ottawa, Kalamazoo, and Allegan counties uh, who previously put mask mandates in place. Some, some schools without countywide mandates are making the, their choice on their own to require masks. One example is Warren Consolidated Schools in Macomb County, the state's 10th largest district with 13,000 students. The district has anou had announced in early August that masks would be optional, but faced with growing concern about the Delta variant and increasing stri uh, strident federal and state recommendations that face masks be required, the district changed their course on Sunday requiring masks for all, for all staff and students. In a quote from uh, the Warren Consolidated School District Superintendent Robert Livernoy, he said, quote, given the vaccine, it, get that the vaccine is not available for children younger than 12 and many live with older siblings, the spread of COVID-19 and, and the more contagious Delta variant remain a significant concern. He continued, this is especially, more, especially important as cases are increasing just as schools are returning to full-time in-person learning this fall, in, in close quote. In the Plymouth Canton Community Schools, they announced a mandate on Monday, making it the seventh of the state's 10 largest enrollment school districts to require face masks. Among the top 10, Utica and Chippewa Valley in Macomb County and Livonia and Wayne County remain mask optional. Other districts without mandates include Detroit, Dearborn, Rochester, Grand Rapids, and Lansing. Um, Whitmer and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services issued a statewide mask mandate during the 2020-2021 school year, but have so far stopped short of requiring face masks this fall, instead issuing guidance that strongly recommends masks. Um, but that, res and that uh, because there's been some resistance, uh, school leaders responded by saying that medical experts rather than superintendents and school boards should make the decisions about masks. Robert McCann, executive director of the K-12 Alliance for Michigan, a school advocacy group, said repeatedly during this summer uh, that schools facing intense pressure from local from vocal anti-vax parents would never mandate masks on their own. Uh, but that resistance has started to crumble in the past week. The percentage of Michigan schools attending uh, students attending schools where, where masks are mandated for at least some students rose from about 35% on Monday to 46% the next day, according to data collected and shared with, uh, but collected by the state and shared with Bridge, Michigan. So we're seeing more mask mandates go into order, uh, either because of mask, mask mandates that are ordered at the county level or because individual school districts concerned with the Delta variant and, and hearing the voices of parents, students, staff, and faculty alike are making those decisions. That being said, these mandates, these regulations that are being put in place as a preventative measure against the Delta variant uh, and as we continue to try to get our communities vaccinated and wait for the period at which younger children will be eligible for vaccines, Despite all of that, still being met with a lot of resistance. This article next on the website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus also being met with a lot of opposition. This from Bridge Magazine with roughly two weeks before classes start at Gross Point Public Schools. Beth Bright Wood is rushing to make decisions on what to do next for her severely asthmatic seven-year-old son and five-year-old daughter. The school district currently is not requiring masks for upcoming school year and Bright Wood is for now planning to un unenroll her daughter from kindergarten and have her son learn at home. In a quote, she said, my husband and I have chosen, ha have to choose between our children's health or their education and that's not right, in a clo and closed quote. For months across Michigan and much of the country, People opposed to mask mandates have dominated the news with loud protests at school board meetings as districts wrestle with, face, with decisions on face masks. Brightwood is among parents who favor school mask mandates, who are organizing rallies, issuing news releases, and, and peppering school leaders to make sure their voices are also being heard amid a cacophony of anti-mask protests. One pro-mask rally was held Wednesday outside the Macomb County Health Department, just miles and a few hours away from an anti-mask protest at the Oakland County Health Division. Seeing the unmask our children parents get really vocal at the school board meetings, I think a lot of us thought we, now we need to start speaking up too, said Emily Melitz, the mother of a first and third grader in the Romeo Community School District, Schools in, in Macomb County. They think they are the majority and quite, quite frankly, 
They may not, they may not be, said Mellitz. Parents who criticize mask mandates have raised a number of concerns from arguing that parents should have the freedom to decide if their children wear face coverings to masks interfere with students' educational and social development. Michigan Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky has questioned the science behind the effectiveness of masks to protect against COVID in schools and cited studies indicating the virus is no more harmful to children than to the flu, which, uh, of course, have uh, not been supported by the Centers for Disease Control, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and uh, people that can reason and put basic scientific facts that we know about novel coronavirus together. But it's okay. Mike Shirky's made a lot of these comments uh, in, in the past regarding COVID-19 and has been feverishly wrong each and every time. So uh, at least he's consistent. Uh, but with the Delta variant continuing to fuel a rise in COVID-19 cases, and children under the age of 12 still not eligible for, vac for vaccines, pro-mask parents say, are, say they are tired of seeding the public square to anti-mask families. The Elkton County Health Division, of course, announced on Tuesday that everyone in elementary, middle, and high schools, as well as vocational schools in the county, will be required to wear facial coverings regard regardless of COVID-19 vaccination status. The edict will remain in effect until 14 days after the CDC determines COVID-19 in the county is moderate or lower currently Oakland County stands in the high category. So we're seeing, especially in the last several weeks, we've seen a lot of anti-mask parents or, or parents that are against these mandates in particular and would be uh, more in favor of individual choice from parent, parent to, to uh, student to student, family to family, as opposed to district-wide decisions or county-wide decisions being mandated upon them and their children. Uh, and some have been extremely vocal and some have been very, very much less than cordial at these school board meetings. And in many cases, as we talked about yesterday briefly, there was a situation uh, at a Birmingham school board meeting uh, where some parents were, were giving Nazi salutes in response to parents that were pro-mask. Some of these have been extremely unprofessional, have been extremely combative, and have not been productive conversations, where in other places there have been productive conversations where both sides of, of the coin here are able to have their voices heard, have their opinions heard, and in some cases, at the very least, maybe find the ability to agree to disagree and leave the decisions up to those who are ultimately responsible for making the decisions that keep the students, staff, and faculty of these school districts safe, which are those school administrators and the county health departments. Uh, more, more information on our website, of course, on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, including helpful links to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and all of these articles today. We have another article up there, but we're a little bit short on time. Uh, that regards unemployment benefits that may uh, be coming to an end for hundreds of thousands of people here in the state of Michigan. So uh, you're going to want to read that article as well. And you know what? He here's the thing. I owe you the news each day. You owe me going to civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus and reading our articles uh, each and every day and following those links to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the state of Michigan, and Oakland County's COVID-19 informational pages. we got a good show in ahead for you today, an uh, action-packed program. Coming up, I'll speak to Kurt Metzger the mayor of Pleasant Ridge, who's also a big advocate for census data and has been working on the front lines to make sure that uh, the, tr the city of Detroit is properly counted, believes that there are some issues with the way that, that the city of Detroit was counted uh, in the U.S. Census in 2020. We'll also be speaking at the bottom of the hour with Dr. Varun Vora from the Michigan Poison Center uh, about some common, some, some common um, issues currently with some people uh, in their reaction to trying to prevent COVID-19. And just as we transition out of summer and into the fall, some of the common hazards that could be poisonous to you and your family in your home and, and ways to avoid those hazards. Then in the 11 o'clock hour, we'll be speaking with Dustin McClellan from the Pontiac Community Foundation. We'll also be speaking with Chris Godolka and Christina Percoli from the Sylvan Table Restaurant. And then we'll wrap up the show later on with a chef and recipe creator and food photographer, Megan Gregory. That all coming up next, you're watching and listening to the Megacast. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom. 
telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. Census data from 2020 has started to file out and we're starting to be able to analyze all the data and the changes that we've under undergone in our communities over the past 10 years. But some of those changes may not be entirely accurate for a number of different reasons. And one person that, that knows a lot about that and has some strong opinions on those uh, discrepancies is the current mayor and the outgoing mayor of Pleasant Ridge, Kurt Metzger, with us on the Megacast. Kurt, thanks for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate having you on. In addition to Thanks. your role with the city of Pleasant Ridge, you're also a demographer and a member of Detroit's census-wide uh, census -wide committee. And, and we've already seen some articles uh, this week wh where Mayor Mike Duggan has mentioned that he believes the city of Detroit's population count, which, has, which according to the census data, has significantly dropped. He believes that, that Detroit was misrepresented in the census data because of the circumstances of the pandemic. And do you have that same thought, having looked at some of the data that's been out so far? Do you believe that Mike, that Mike Duggan, the mayor of the city of Detroit, is on point with that, with that uh, argument? Or is this census data truly, as far as we can get it, accurate? Well, there's... Uh... I, I, I do believe, you know, I'm starting to look a little bit more detail, and that's what's going to take uh, to really drill down in the city to understand what, what changes occurred. The fact that Detroit lost 74,000 people was a little bit more than was it anticipated. We expected a loss, so that was the first shock. Um, when you look at the data, the only group, the only race and ethnic group to drop was the African-American community, which actually fell by 93,000. Now, Detroit claims that they've got DTE records that show more house, more occupied housing units than the census counted. Um, we also know that Detroit had a lot of problems with the fact that the census was done online and a lot of people were not are not connected in the city of Detroit. We also know that the pandemic basically eliminated all their outreach activities that they had planned uh, up until the very last minute. And then when the Trump administration decided to, to stop the census two weeks early, uh, a lot of the, the follow-up, the Census Bureau sending enumerators out to knock on doors from which they had not received responses, that was, that was eliminated at those last two weeks, which were very critical to get to the hardest to enumerate. So there is that. Uh, those factors play a big role in making us think that there were a number of people missed. The other thing, but as I start looking, as you look outside the city of Detroit, growth in the African-American community in Oakland County, in Macomb County, and out Wayne County, leads you to believe that a lot of African-Americans moved out of the city and moved into the surrounding suburbs. So we have to balance those two and we'll be looking Hopefully, I'll be part of a group that will be looking at more detailed, uh, nuanced data to try to better understand what actually happened. According to the U.S. Census, 
uh, data from 2020 that bet between 2010 and 2020 censuses, the U the uh, pop the African American population in Detroit dropped. But uh, it's showing in this data that there's been some rapid growth of the black population in Wayne County in places like Harper Woods, in Macomb County, and in places such as East Point, which are in surrounding areas of Detroit, which which suggest otherwise. And then you mentioned Mayor Duggan's claim that uh, there are, that that DTE has reported significantly more residential units uh, that are being counted for their numbers on a regular basis than was counted in the U.S. Census. That differential is significant. Uh, the census claiming 254,000 occupied households, while DTE Energy reports 280,000 residential homes are currently paying electric bills. And, and part of this issue with these missing people, so to speak. They're not missing. We're not, we know that there are people there that always are going to slip through the cracks with the U.S. Census. census. It's the nature of the uh, it's an, it's the nature of the information gathering that some people are going to fall through the cracks, no matter how much effort is put into this. But in the situation in 2020, where you did have that reduction and that delay and that stop and start in those door-to-door -door interactions. Some people do get missed because that is being done on a very local basis. In Wixom, where I live, despite me fi filling out the census over the phone, uh, I had multiple people come to my door at my apartment looking for, uh, because they had not uh, had my address marked off of their papers yet. But that may not be the case in places like Detroit. So, go so leading up to the end of the deadline, to the, to the deadline of collecting data, was Detroit seeing a struggle to get those people on those front lines to go door to door, especially because of the situation of the pandemic at that point in time? Yeah, you've done your homework quite well. Um, yes, I mean, obviously the census will go, you know, it, the harder to count areas, those areas that have the most vacancies, those areas that are seen as being, uh, a little bit iffy in terms of uh, blight and people feel a little bit hesitant to go out. That tends to be the neighborhoods where you have the highest non-response rate. But it's also depending on how the Census Bureau did their follow-up, which, which was delayed starting. And as I said, was ended two weeks early by the Trump administration. We, the assumption is that there were a number of housing units, particularly in those hard to count areas. And Detroit has more than certainly any place in Michigan and more than most of the major cities in the country. We know that they have the highest poverty. We knew that there were a lot of issues in terms of vacancies and, and uh, problems finding people. That's the assumption is therefore the Census Bureau did not go to every place. It's possible, you know, there's still some questions nationally, they're looking at issues around non-response on questions. Um, there's some still discussions as to what happened in terms of pandemic, the various procedures that were planned and then postponed and some were eliminated. And certainly the work done at the local level, getting the word out, doing the knocking, door knocking. Um, Detroit had a tremendous outreach program planned that was kind of scuttled in most cases, and it became more of a online presence, more of a public relations and advertising. And so those kinds of issues all play into this. I don't know. I mean, in, in between 2000 and 2010, 185,000 African Americans left the city of Detroit. Um, so we're now down to half of that. It's very possible that a great percentage of that number actually were counted, but they were counted in other communities. So again, we need to look a lot further. And, and I, you know, we, we have also have to realize that those DTE counts need to be as of April of 2000, because that's census day. And so we need to start looking at, you know, the, the hookups by actually by neighborhood instead of looking citywide. And so we'll be doing a lot more of that. 
We're joined by Kurt Metzger. He is the outgoing mayor of Pleasant Ridge. He's also a demographer and a member of Detroit's census-wide committee. Joining us today on the Megacast, and, and as per reports from the U.S. Census, uh, Detroit lost about 10.5 percent of its population, falling to a population of just 639,111 residents. Mayor Mike Duggan, of course, disputes that, as do many other people in the city and on that census committee. Uh, and Mike Duggan even said, claimed that he believes Detroit was undercounted, quote, by at least 10 percent and closed quote and these have major impacts on the city of Detroit and, and just like missing census data or undercounted data can have significant impacts on the on your state or on other communities as well Michigan of course lost a congressional seat because of its drop in population compared to other states in the Union and so that's going to have a significant impact but in the city of Detroit this can also have a significant impact on federal funding for, for roads, for infrastructure, for other major issues that clearly need to be addressed and could be impacted by this undercounting. So, Kurt, my question for you is, with this data having been what it is, it's been collected, mm -hmm. that it is what it is from the 2020 census, but we have this information from DTE and from other resources about, about how much uh, of an undercount this could be. What can be done at the community level and, and in the city, in the region to potentially correct this undercounting or address this undercounting? Can that be petitioned to the U.S. Census Bureau for a change? Well, it can be. I mean, it, it, it's not easy. The Census Bureau does not just yeah. automatically, if somebody says, we were undercounted and I, based on these records, we have this many more people. Uh, it's not that easy. The Census Bureau requires a great deal of, of of data and a great deal of information um, to challenge. Uh, they only accept certain kinds of information. And even at that, very seldom does the Census Bureau make major changes. Um, and those changes will not occur for a period, even if, even if Detroit gets in a very detailed challenge by the end of the year, that has to be studied. People are going to be looking at it. The 2020 numbers, even with an even with a possible adjustment down the road, will still be the the final numbers that will be that will be people will see when they go to all their publications. Even even if the numbers are adjusted, all the data that come out based on the 2020 census going forward will all still be predicated on that 639-111, even if there is a change. So yes, there's a challenge procedure and there may be some success in the end, but it's a very long road. It's a very difficult road. And I imagine there will be other communities across the country, not necessarily in Southeast Michigan. I don't, haven't seen or heard complaints. Um, when you look at Oakland County communities, you look at Macomb and, and, and Wayne, Surprisingly, a lot of a lot of communities did quite well, and especially ethnic communities like Hamtramck and Dearborn, Dearborn Heights. Um, the ethnic communities really came out and responded to the census. Um, you see that in the increasing numbers in Oakland County, but you see it throughout the region. Uh, so it's you know it's going to be difficult. It's it's going to be difficult. It's going to require a lot of uh, analysis and some really good strong data to make the case. We're joined by Kurt Metzger. He is the mayor, the outgoing mayor of Pleasant Ridge, a demographer <laughs> as well as a member of the Detroit Census-wide committee. And I'm just looking at the census website, at census.gov, and some of their specific program procedures for, for example, their count question resolution program and and uh, and their uh, requirements for appeals to census data. And there's there, there are tons of hoops to jump through. There's a lot of detail that goes into that, and especially where you have a s situation where a major city, like the city of Detroit, won't be alone in believing it's undercounted, especially in uh, given the year that we that we held this current census in in 2020, in 2020, and because of the challenges that were there. So, Kurt, just a few more minutes with you, and, and I have said multiple times as I've reset and, and reintroduced you to those that may be tuning in in process that you're the outgoing mayor of Pleasant Ridge. Why outgoing at this point? Yeah, you you keep quite making that point. Um, I have been mayor now for eight years. It's been a wonderful eight years, but you know I'm getting up in age, and I just thought. After, you know, after eight years, I think, 
you got to know when to, as they, as Kenny Rogers said, you got to know when to fold them. Um, and I've really enjoyed myself. I don't want to start having be, having it become routine um, or lose that edge. And I think I have uh, a commissioner who's been with me for the eight years and is and I feel very strongly about. It. He's very interested in in taking over the job. And so I thought, you know, knowing full well that that I would that my that the mayor position would be well filled. Um, I decided it was time to step down and, and put my support behind uh, Brett Scott. So it's been you know it's been great. I've, we've accomplished a lot in terms of Pleasant Ridge. We even gained population between 2010 and 2020. So I feel total success, and I feel that I can step down uh, knowing that it's this city is in good hands and and will continue to be kind of a. a popular place for young families uh, and others to, to live. Well, as we prepare for you to leave your position as mayor of, of Pleasant Ridge, we, got, we want to look back at, at an issue that has continued to be an issue in, throughout our local area and really has inflated over the past couple of months, and that's the issue with these power outages and these severe storms. Uh, a couple of years ago, you were quoted in a Free Press article about DTE outages saying, uh, in, in, at least in terms of Pleasant Ridge residents, quote, most of our res residents didn't think trees were the issue for years and years. We have not had a, we, we have had not a love-hate relationship with DTE. It was just a hate relationship and then <laughs> chuckled. Um, so, in terms of what can be done, what is being, what what has been done since 2019, in these two years plus since that point in the issue, has DTE made any progress in Pleasant Ridge in your local area in terms of curbing some of these power outages? Has the issue stayed the same? And then on top of that, what can be done from a resident level, from a local government level, to address that issue? As we've seen more and more severe weather this summer than we have in the past. Right, and we'll continue to, no doubt. Yeah. Um, and, and DTE has admitted that they are behind in two, two areas, tree trimming and infrastructure um, improvements. And DTE did come out, we did actually have a, uh, an open house where DTE brought all their staff and had tables and maps and everything else. So they've been very accommodating in terms of coming and, and meeting with Pleasant Ridge residents. Obviously, there was, I think people kind of forget, and then this summer has just been really difficult. We've had a, a lot of tree trimming in, in Pleasant Ridge. We have, obviously, we celebrate our tree canopy, but we have so many large, large trees. We actually had one fall down in our, or a huge limb fall in our backyard and crush our screen house, and luckily it didn't hit uh, the power, but it did hit internet. So we just got our internet back. Um, but half the city was out again um, on the east side of, of Pleasant Ridge where we live. The southern part of that was luckily um, part of an infrastructure improvement in Ferndale, which has which kept our lights on this time around. But the the area just north of us which is on a Royal Oak grid, transformers went out and they were out until last night. Um, the west side, there have been a couple areas of the west side that have been out four and five times this, this summer. Um, so if you look at our Pleasant Ridge Facebook pages, our resident Facebook pages, there isn't a lot of love for DTE still. And certainly with, uh, there's a lot of, lot of talk about going to the Public Service Commission following Dana Nessel's suggestions and and really there's a lot of um, continued upset. Again, it's trees. I mean, we love our trees, but uh, until they fall and knock a, a line down. But I think much of what we've seen are, are at least where problems lie, it seems to be infrastructure as well. And DTE is going to have to get um, a lot of that repaired. I know it's a huge job, but uh, yeah, Pleasant Ridge isn't, if you go out to not talk to most Pleasant Ridge residents, they will not be singing the praises of DTE, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately what I think is, the, is going to be the case and continue to be the case in many places locally here in southeastern Michigan with these power outages as we continue to see more severe weather over time. Kurt, we appreciate having you on the show today. 
My pleasure. Thanks so much. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if when I did get home that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary. And if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith here in our studios in West Greenfield Township as we continue to bring you the latest news and information about COVID-19 and speak to guests from throughout Oakland County and around the state of Michigan about topics that are important to you Michiganders tuning in in the local area on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access and throughout the state and the world online on civiccentertv.com and on my Michigan TV as well. Uh, well, as we transition from the summer into the fall season and, and as we continue to have more questions pop up about COVID-19 and the future of this pandemic, more people are experimenting and there are also common hazards that are there everywhere in, in our everyday life that we should be aware of and be trying to actively avoid or at the very least be ready to respond to should we fall victim to them in our own homes and our workplaces and out in the regular world. And to, to talk about some of those hazards and ways we can avoid some of these issues, we're pleased to be joined once again by Dr. Varun Vora. He is the academic director and clinical toxicologist at the Michigan Poison Center. Dr. Vora, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate having you on. Let's start with uh, a, a more concerning and COVID-19 related uh, mm -hmm. uh, issue that's co coming up right now. Uh, there have been some people that have been trying to treat COVID-19 or prevent COVID-19 without getting vaccinated, without the mask wearing, and instead taking uh, ivermectin, which is an animal drug uh, that is used for cattle and horses. You would think that would be common knowledge that a that a medication that is intended for other animals is probably not safe for humans to ingest but in this case one why are people taking these what what do they think it's it's helping them do to prevent covid-19 and then on top of that why is experimenting with these drugs meant for other animals so dangerous yeah, so it's a it's a trend that we've noticed, um, and we did see a spike at least from our center in calls related to ivermectin exposure shortly after sort of the national emergency was declared uh, around April May last year, and as well there's a random spike in April of this year um, seems to be calming down a little bit at least in this area. Uh, but other states are definitely experiencing um, a surge in volume related to these cases of ivermectin, people using ivermectin. So Alabama and Mississippi especially have reported uh, cases, even Oklahoma, Mississippi recording up to 70% of certain calls in a certain time frame related to ivermectin. Um, so you're right, ivermectin, it's known as kind of a dewormer. Um, it's for like uh, parasites in horses and cows but it can also be used in humans as well. So it does have some indications for things like head lice and uh, skin conditions like rosacea in humans, but um, those are solely indicated for those purposes. So uh, as far as for COVID-19, there are there's an ongoing research out there currently um, in vitro studies, so more, you know, not in humans, um, showing that it might have a potential effect um, against certain viruses like COVID-19. But again, there's it's insufficient evidence at this point. Um, and the NIH um, has found no current evidence to suggest that it's gonna be useful in humans so far from the clinical trials that have been done. 
Um, so it is something that we're actively monitoring. Um, and why people can get into trouble with this is because, um, you know, people who aren't consulting healthcare professionals who aren't doing their homework and uh, not complying with the advisories from uh, organizations like the FDA, uh, if they're taking certain doses that are meant for things like horse, like, you know, animals like horses and cows, uh, those are big animals. So it's highly concentrated material where you're taking doses meant for animals that are um, immensely larger than we are normally, the average human, right? So that puts people at risk of, of toxicity. Um, and ivermectin can have toxic exposures in big doses. So you can see things like rashes, um, mostly GI symptoms, especially, you know, abdo uh, abdominal pain, vomiting, nausea. Uh, there are reports of seizures out there as well. Um, and low blood pressure, high heart rate. So those are things that we definitely want to avoid. We're talking with, with Dr. Varun Vora from uh, the Michigan Poison Center. He's an, their academic director and a clinical toxicologist with the Michigan Poison Center. And, and just to complete the circle on that uh, first issue with ivermectin, uh, in a statement from the FDA on, on Saturday, they tweeted out, you are not a horse, you are not a cow. Seriously, y'all, stop it. So uh, that's, that, that's right. about it, the best way. To, to put right. that you're not a horse you're not a cow so exactly. uh, consult with your doctor before medicating with things that are uh, meant to be prescribed um, other issues that are currently affecting some people across the u.s there have been a number of food recalls uh, frozen cooked shrimp hamburgers uh, hot dog buns frozen chicken um, how should people go what do, would you suggest or what would the poison center suggest in terms of people going about understanding if the food that is in their freezer is in their refrigerator has been recalled and what should they do after they uh, come under the understanding that they have recalled food uh, that's in their home so i think the first thing that i would recommend is um you know being up to date with the advisories especially you know going to the cdc website and the fda website they do have lists of certain agents um, and certain food products that have been recalled um, and then do essentially a cross-reference with the materials that you have in your fridge. And if there's any doubt, um, I think, you know, the, the best piece of advice would be not to engage, right? And to, to get rid of those food items um, because we don't want to risk, um, you know, the risk benefit profile is, is not favorable in those situations. Um, and, you know, I think the most important thing would be, you know, if you have any questions, again, you can call us, right? So we not only deal with poisoning emergencies, but also information. So whether that's related to drugs, food, what have you, um, please call us and then we'll, we'll be happy to answer those questions because we have specialists on hand that can get you that information really quickly. Dr. Vern Vora jo joins us on the Megacast. He is the academic director and clinical toxicologist at the Michigan Poison Center. And for those uh, that may become affected by these recalled materials, uh, how, how do they know the difference uh, in between them just having some uh, adverse reactions to certain foods, as many people do have, versus food poisoning. How do, how do you tell the difference between one versus the other? You know, I think the main thing, the, they're going to share similar symptoms, mostly GI symptoms, uh, you know, the nausea, the vomiting, the, the abdominal pain mostly, which can start relatively early, but I think if it continues to progress and it's protracted and it's not going away, um, you know, if you eat something kind of spoiled, usually you'll be sick for a little bit and then eventually it'll get better with hydration and whatnot. Um, but otherwise, you know, with true food poisoning, um, these things can last a long time, several days even. So um, if, you're, if you're not getting better or if you're noticing that symptoms are getting worse even, um, I think the best thing to do, you know, there's several options. You can either call, you know, call the Poison Center, 1-800-222-1222, uh, um, or go to your local urgent care, or if it's really, you know, um, if it's advised from, say, the Poison Center or whoever, uh, healthcare professional that you might see at the urgent care, there might be a need to go to the emergency department for, for a workup. We're joined by Dr. Varun Vora. He is the clinical toxicologist and academic director at the Michigan Poison Center with us today on the Megacast. And uh, with marijuana being legal now in the uh, in the state of Michigan, and with we're seeing uh, more of the dispensaries pop up and more people are being able to have access uh, to cannabis and to cannabis products, but that also raises some concerns for those materials, much like alcohol or, uh, or over-the-counter right. drugs uh, in the home, being able to be uh, taken into the possession of children or ingested by children, particularly young children. What are some of the adverse effects that can, that can be had if, if for example, 
uh, a young child or a child, you know, zero to 19 years old is then taking a marijuana edible from their parents medicine cabinet or wherever they store their uh, ca their cannabis materials what kind of effects can that have on a child yeah so i think you know you, you bring up a good point is that um you know especially the edibles uh, can be a particular significance just because i know there's been a big push recently uh, from regulatory agencies within michigan to to push for altered packaging because historically the packaging has looked very attractive. It's colorful, um, it looks like candy. Um, so those things entice young people, um, whether it's experimentation, inadvertent ingestions, what have you. Um, you know, people can get into these things, especially kids thinking that they're gummies and candies and whatnot. So, uh, and they're infused into to food products like brownies, you know, uh, cookies and what have you um, at higher doses. So sometimes they can reach up to 20 times the dose in a regular uh, marijuana joint. Um, so, you know, adverse events that we typically see, you'll see that sort of central nervous system depression. So that, you know, loss of coordination, drowsiness, sedation, uh, lethargy, uh, sometimes vomiting, and then as well, it can lead to, you know, fast heart rate. And eventually that'll eventually work down how, depending on how severe it is, it could lead to a lower heart rate and lower blood pressure as well, which we don't want. That's, that's, that's pretty significant and significant in children as well, because they have a lower body surface area, right? So it doesn't take as much product um, to get into trouble versus doses or products that are meant for adult consumption. We're joined by Dr. Varun Vora from the Michigan Poison Center and Dr. Vora with, with the with that being the case, with, with the effects that this can have if it's ingested, if these products are ingested by children, and, and you talk about some of the ways we can prevent um, them getting it, this into their possession inadvertently be, by changing the packaging, but it brings up the question, I think a lot of people would then have the question, should marijuana edible, edibles be something that's con that is um, deemed eligible and legal under the state's marijuana legality laws because, of the, because there is that that chance for confusion. Should that even should we even be putting those products out there because of their concentration of of THC and in some or in some cases uh, just CBD and, and the effects that that mm -hmm. can have if it's inadvertently in the possession of a child. Yeah, I think you know that's a bigger that's definitely a broader discussion um, because you know we have recognized the therapeutic effects of things like yes. THC and CBD. So um, I think that would run into um, a lot of um, legislative hoops, to be honest, and, and, and bureaucracy. But I think there are certain things that we can do and that people can do you know, every day, every day uh, to mitigate potential exposures in children. So first thing would be to keep them plainly out of sight, out of reach of children. And then a big thing also, you know, don't consume these products around children because if they see you doing it they might be curious and might be interested and then you know the phone rings or you get distracted you might leave these products out right so i think the best thing to do is to do them um, away from children when they, after they go to bed um, or whatever the case may be um, and then keep them in you know even a locked cabinet keep them in their original container uh, or even put them in a new container that has you know a lock into it or a lock to it that may be more uh, a lot more difficult for children to access but as far as um, you know outright prohibiting these substances i think there's been a big push to get these substances uh, permitted that i think it would be it would take a lot of undoing especially with the with the now uh, known therapeutic effects of, of these agents so with that being the case, what should parents, uh, what should people, what, yeah, what should parents be doing, should, should, what action should parents take if they do suspect that their child has taken an, an edible and is not, uh, and, and has done so accidentally, has taken, a, has taken an edible, what action should parents be taking? So I think the first thing, um, and you know, working at a poison center, I think the first thing is, you know, try not to panic and then, you know, call us. So again, the number is 1-800-222-1222. For locals, you can call 313-486-0078, uh, and that'll reach our, that'll reach us as well um, in the event that you can't get through right away. Uh, we have specialists, trained specialists on hand to, to kind of walk you through the situation and they'll gather all the information necessary as to what you think happened. Um, that may require just observing the child for a little bit to see if um, they are not behaving like they normally do. Uh, if they, the parents, it's gonna rely heavily on the parents noticing any potential symptoms. 
And if it's completely unclear and there's there's a possible case for significant exposure, uh, we will make the recommendations going forward to to go to an urgent care or ED um, to just to be safe to to get the child worked up, uh, which will usually require an observation period, of typically like six hours, four to six hours, to see if anything occurs, and uh, knowing that they're in safe hands. But I think the biggest thing is to know your resources and give us a call immediately if you do suspect that. Above all, do not make the child vomit. I think that's the most important thing. That you know, that's kind of a um, an antiquated. Um, uh, behavior that you know has has happened well in the past, but we do know we no longer recommend making the child vomit because that can lead to a whole host of other symptoms potentially, such as aspiration, uh, where you get it into the lungs, and that can uh, lead to things like infections and, and a whole host of badness. Dr. Varun Vora joins us on the MegaCast. He is the academic director and clinical toxicologist at the Michigan Poison Center. And Dr. Vora, as we're transitioning uh, out of summer and into the fall, what are some common hazards that do arise at this time of the year in that transition uh, in the home and, and also in, in office spaces as well that people should be aware of and, and some ways they can prevent falling victim to those hazards? So I think there's several things. I mean, even looking in your garden. So one would be pokeweeds uh, or pokeweed. Um, so these, this is kind of a plant that has a, that has what look like edible berries and or grapes uh, that can be found um, in the gardens and crops. And typically, they arrive in late summer and go through winter. Um, and that can cause a lot of issues with, especially amongst children who get into them. Um, can cause a lot of GI upset, a lot of vomiting. Um, and, and, you know, pretty severe adverse effects depending on how many berries are ingested. Um, I think the most important thing to do, um, you know, the whole part of the plant can be harmful. The root is the most toxic. So if you do notice um, pokeweed saplings, say in your garden, the best thing to do would be to dig them up from the root upwards, uh, let them dry out away from, you know, other plants, other things, kids, you know, children, what have you. Um, and then you know, toss them out with, with your yard waste. I think that would be um, the most sensible thing to do. And again, if you have any questions, just call us and we can help identify it for you. If you take a photo of it and send it to us, we can we can help you uh, confirm what, what it actually is. Um, other things that we've seen recently an uptick in is uh, liquid laundry packets. So, you know, those, those detergent packs. Um, and I know those have been a pretty, uh, pretty common um, trend since even 2012 when the Consumer Product Safety Commission put out the warnings out there about, you know, those pods that children can get into. Um, so recent studies that have come out have shown that those liquid laundry packets compared to traditional detergent, the liquid detergent that you just pour into the into the washer, um, they have increased odds of going uh, emergency, emergency department visits uh, compared to traditional laundry detergent and even greater odds of upwards of eight times the odds of a more serious outcome in children, um, especially children younger than six. So these things can cause uh, vomiting, it can cause burns in the throat, um, it can cause eye problems as well, if you like ocular damage, if they get in the eyes or even the skin. Um, so there have been, there've been you know, uh, initiatives made by the American Society of Testing Material in 2014 uh, to create standards uh, to make it more safe and try to mitigate these exposures. So that includes kind of coating the outer film with an adverse, aversive product that makes it taste really bad, um, taking longer time to dissolve as well, and then clearly labeling the hazards associated with exposure to these products um, as well. So we've seen uh, a mitigation in, in exposures and more serious outcomes, but still they're always kind of a hazard. So prior to the summer, we had about 19 cases per month on average, but since May, We've seen about 35 cases on average. So it's something that we're trending and continuing to look towards, and we're gonna to continue to do outreach education um, about this, uh, letting the public know uh, the potential dangers. Dr. Vora, we appreciate your time. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Take appreciate care. Appreciate Dr. Vern Vora from the Michigan Poison Center. Joining us today on the MegaCast, if you have an issue and, and you need to call the Poison Center, 1-800-222-1222. We're going to take a break here on the MegaCast. On the other side, we'll be going to our neighbors down in Pontiac and speaking with the founder and CEO of the Pontiac Community Foundation, Dustin McClellan, joins us next on the MegaCast. You're watching and listening to the program live, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. The MegaCast returns after this break. Motorcyclists are hard to see. To keep everyone safer, it's important to always look for them and know where most crashes occur. 84% of motorcycle and vehicle crashes happen on streets, not highways. 
and most crashes with motorcyclists occur when vehicle drivers are turning left. So before turning, especially to the left, make sure you look for motorcyclists. Then look again. It could save a life. To Sofia and Gabriel, even though these old knees can't follow on your adventure to the forest today, these flowers represent my love. These stitches and threads join us together. And wherever you see a flower, a bird, a beautiful tree, know that my love is with you. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. You're watching and listening to our program, of course, on Civic Center TV and, uh, and on Birmingham Area Municipal Access on Comcast, Channel 15, and AT&T, Channel 99. You're listening to us on your radio home for, homes for the Megacast, Civic Center TV, sorry, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kegel Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. In addition, we're online on civiccentertv.com, as well as on My Michigan TV, Michigan's streaming network. You can find My Michigan TV on your smartphone app, uh, on the smartphone app, on your smart TV app store as well, and on, online at mymitv.com. That is mymitv.com for My Michigan TV or My My. Well, uh, we're pleased to be joined now to start off our second hour of the show by Dustin McClellan. He is the founder and CEO of the Pontiac Community Foundation. Dustin, thanks for being back with us today. Tyler, great to be with you and the team at the Megacast. Always appreciate you guys having us out. Yeah, appreciate having you on. So uh, tell us a little bit what's been going on lately with the Pontiac Community Foundation. Yeah, thanks so much, Tyler. You know, uh, for those that uh, may be uh, hearing about us for the first time, the Pontiac Community Foundation is a, a independent 51c3 organization dedicated to building a brighter future for Pontiac and we really serve as a uh, critical leadership organization in the city of Pontiac at times serving as a funder fiduciary a convener thought leader partner uh, for uh, programs initiatives that, that we really feel uh, will target strategic issues in the community of Pontiac and so uh, we've had a, a very vibrant summer uh, we've just wrapped up our uh, open streets programming uh, under what we call our neighborhood investment uh, bucket, uh, where we work with uh, local organizations to promote uh, healthy activity and play uh, uh, at local parks and, and, and blocking off the streets adjoining those parks to expand those play areas. That's something we started uh, in, in uh, 2020 as kind of a, a relief effort during COVID to uh, get folks outdoors and utilizing those uh, resources. And so we just wrapped that, that up, was able to have uh, many, many children and families out in those activities. I'm grateful for our wonderful partners that helped us and, and helped sponsor that uh, wonderful event. Dovetailing that this fall, uh, we're launching a, a redevelopment initiative of Maddie McKinney Hatchet Park, a local neighborhood park that uh, is desperately in need of, of some updating and upgrading. Uh, Maddie McKinney Hatchet is a former elected official, hometown hero for us. And so uh, we're just excited to, uh, to be playing uh, such a role in the city, honored that the residents and, and local government would have us do that. And of course, there's many other things going on as well, Tyler, that, that I'm sure we'll get into. So give us a little bit more of the details on the redevelopment of the park. What is that redevelopment gonna look like and what is kind of the thought behind that redevelopment and what's the purpose of going about it the way that the Pontiac Community Foundation is? That's great. So Manny McKinney Park is a about a two acre park on the east side of, of town. 
And, um, you know, we've talked previously, Tyler, about Pontiac's challenges coming out of emergency manage management and receivership and, you know, uh, putting dollars toward parks and recreation and redevelopment of, of parks that haven't been touched or maintained for many years is a challenge. And so, you know, the, the neighborhood and particularly uh, uh, Commissioner Emeritus Maddie McKinney Hatchett, who lives near the park, brought this to our attention and said, hey, what if we join together, we, we invested dollars, redevelop this park, use it as a catalyst in our, in our neighborhoods and city uh, for other park developments uh, and really create a state of the art space uh, in the midst of the city. And so that's really what we're doing. We're working with uh, two of our, our board members, uh, Kyle Westberg who owns West Construction and Zareb Patrick Zaremba who owns Zareb and Co Landscape Architects uh, to, to put together an incredible design for this park. Uh, and, and then leveraging uh, the goodwill of, of residents across the area, both in Pontiac and outside of Pontiac, to raise the dollars, and of course other philanthropic partners, and to spend uh, near half a million dollars uh, on this park uh, to, to create new uh, walking paths, new basketball courts and exercise equipment, all of the amenities that, you know, someone living in a local neighborhood would want in their park and we're hoping to uplift uh, that need and opportunity in the city of Pontiac. And, and those are the kinds of things that are really important to community building because these are gathering places where, uh, where, where neighbors meet each other and build relationships and, bu and build that sense of community. It's also where, uh, much like your Open Streets program, where children where children meet and they, and they play and they get to know the people that are going to be their classmates, their neighbors and so on and build those relationships that ultimately foster a stronger community down the line that's right you know it's it's there's there's several uh, advantages and, and benefits to doing a development and, and work like this overall in the community there, there's the inherent health benefit you know this is a, a statistic that always when people hear they're they're just mind-boggled but the city of Pontiac has a 20 uh 20 year lower life expectancy than surrounding communities. That, that stat comes directly from the Oakland County Health Department. So, uh, you know, promoting healthy play, promoting activity, that's a huge benefit. There's a huge ROI there. Investing in community, getting people together, you know, through community uh, uh, development and citizens district councils and block parties and all those things that, that promote healthy community are, are really well, uh, really good. And then just being a good partner with the city. Uh, just being a good partner with our city. You know, I think sometimes those in, in government, especially as we're seeing it during these COVID times, they get the short end of the stick. And so we can come and be a, a great partner. I think it, it spreads goodwill in our community. We're joined by Dustin McClellan. He, he is the founder and CEO of the Pontiac Community Foundation with us today on the Megacast. And, and to connect the redevelopment of the park with the Open Streets program. Let, let's go back to the Open Streets program uh, because this year is a little bit different than what we went through in 2020 uh, in September and October when you had previously run the Open Streets program uh, uh, initially. So mm -hmm. what, what was the impact of this program in 2021 that was different on, on the children that were able to have those interactions and have the, that free play time as opposed to in 2020 as it was more of a, an uncertainty then, and, and now it's it's been more of a re reopening and a revision of what we're going to be doing going forward, while also still dealing with COVID nineteen. That's a great question, Tyler. You know, the initial uh, innovation of this initiative came by way of a local neighborhood group, Friends of the Pontiac Parks Association, that saw both the need to uh, have uh, safety. Uh, in our local parks through sanitation and signage and those items, but also said, you know, let's use this as an opportunity to get people outdoors. And we're grateful for Oakland County uh, for partnering with us through dollars to make this initiative happen. And of course, when we first launched it in the middle of last year, it, the uh, people were nervous. They were unsure, can we even come outside and recreate and it still be safe? and ensuring that things were properly sanitized and of course social distance thing and all the things outside you know we, we were able to make it a worthwhile event and engagement so when the opportunity came back um, this year to do it you know people were ready they were excited you know although we're still dealing with this pandemic i think through vaccinations and all the other things we have now i, I think people are learning how to deal with it and so you know, the children, the families, the community coming out, even even using vendors 
uh, those that, that have uh, food products and other recreation products, uh, Oakland County Parks, Pontiac Youth Recreation, Sheriff Powell groups that weren't able to do their normal programs last year, uh, for them to be able to come out and partner with us uh, is absolutely incredible. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping that we continue to trend upward, <laughs> both both with, uh, you know, we get through this challenge right now with COVID, but also that we're able to continue to practice healthy community uh, in Pontiac through this initiative. And these kinds of programs are, have also been important for children also dur during this time because of their own isolation be because of the pandemic and their own efforts to stay safe. Because while they usually get that kind of playtime and interaction with other with their peers uh, from school or from summer programs, that wasn't the case in 2020. That's not been the case in many cases so far in 2021 because of the ongoing pandemic where we've had virtual learning or a hybrid learning situation or social distancing where you're not surrounded by many of your cohorts and these kinds mm -hmm. of programs provide a, a safe out, out, outdoor opportunity to have those interactions uh, that supplement what, what's not being had in the school. That's correct. Yeah, you know, we were already seeing challenges in getting folks engaged in local parks and activity prior to the pandemic where things are just changing as a society as technology grows and uh you know even in remote learning that was taking place before COVID, you know now you add all those layers that you just mentioned um it's going to be an ongoing challenge to get this next generation active out of isolation and we know that the other benefits of, of being a, a around other people the mental health benefits uh, as well that we we saw so many challenges there that our children were facing and still are facing you know there's there's a fear about going back to school there's a fear about wearing masks there's a fear about all those things and so how, how do we break through that well, we'll let we'll let all of the, the the big wigs have the debates on what we should and shouldn't do but how do we break through what needs to happen for a child to to just have a have a healthy life so that that's what we're really hoping to accomplish we're joined by Dustin McClellan, founder and CEO of the Pontiac Community Foundation and, and beyond uh, these programs that are in place that are helping children. There's still a number of other things that are in the community, not only in Pontiac, but in our surrounding areas that are still affecting people uh, in terms of COVID-19. What are some of the other efforts that, that the Pontiac Community Foundation has ongoing right now to help people in the community in Pontiac deal with the ongoing effects of uh, and the ever-changing effects of, through time of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question, Tyler. You know, we've talked uh, previously on the Megacast about our Center for Pontiac Entrepreneurship that we launched last year in the midst of the pandemic, seeing the need that you know, budding small businesses and entrepreneurs had for a mentorship, navigating through COVID, capital, uh, keeping things going and alive during COVID, uh, and, and then other skills building and, and networking opportunities. And so we launched that initiative and we're just so grateful that recently we've been able to give out a number of grants to small businesses in the city of Pontiac. Um, everything from uh, daycare, child caring centers to food truck vendors uh, and everything in between folks that are that are just really the the uh, our economic vitality that, that's the name of, the, of that bucket for us the economic vitality these people represent the best of it and so you know we have we had over a hundred applicants um, asking for dollars still indicating that they were struggling trying to navigate navigate through and so uh, we're providing another round of grant funding that'll be announced here in the next couple of months uh, for uh, small businesses in Pontiac and then we're excited about continuing to uh, reach uh, the needs there. The other item I'll just mention is our task force on racial health inequities. Uh, we received some funding last year, knowing challenges that uh, an underserved community like Pontiac faces, uh, particularly even uh, communities of color faced during COVID. Uh, we said, let's do a deep dive analysis and really see what are these perpetuating uh, issues that uh, need to be tackled, need to be identified. Uh, and what are those social determinants of health that, that, are, that are different in a city like Pontiac than other communities that we can tackle uh, both now and, and post COVID. And so we're grateful for the many leaders that are on that task force. That work is kind of coming to, to, to a culmination here in the fall. We'll be producing uh, an action plan for the community to take and understand and others to help uh, pick up alongside of us to, to move forward some actionable items so that, you know, God forbid the next pandemic comes, uh, it doesn't hit community like Pontiac as hard. 
We're joined by Dustin McClellan, founder and CEO of the Pontiac Community Foundation. Dustin, just a few more minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. If people want to get involved with the Pontiac Community Foundation, what are some of the different ways that they can get involved and what are some of the needs of the foundation right now from other people in the community that want to help their neighbors and their friends and other people in Pontiac? Yeah, thank you so much, Tyler. would love for people to check us out on the web, PontiacCommunityFoundation.org or on Facebook, uh, facebook.com uh, forward slash Pontiac Community Foundation. Uh, would love to, uh, for you to send me an email, Dustin at PontiacCommunityFoundation.org. You know, uh, moving forward, this park project, finding uh, both uh, sponsors that uh, would love to to give monetarily, uh, even those that uh, may, maybe the uh, this year has been great for you. Uh, we found that many in construction have had great years and you say, you know what, we, we wanna do uh, an in-kind gift or bring our employees out to do a volunteer day or, or something like that uh, for the re redevelopment of that Manny McKinney Hatchet Park and for the betterment of the community and the children and the families that so desperately deserve to be valued, that have been underserved for many, many years, uh, this would be a great gift back and, and a great way to wrap up uh, a tumultuous couple of years. We're joined by Dustin McClellan, founder and CEO of the Pontiac Community Foundation. Dustin, just another minute before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else that it would be important or interesting for our audience to know today about the Pontiac Community Foundation? Yeah, I'll pivot just a little bit to Pontiac. You know, I, I know folks are reading, we're having an interesting year, elections and so many things happening in Pontiac with Phoenix Center, Ottawa Towers. And I, I just ask folk, folks in the surrounding communities, uh, don't count Pontiac out uh, as we get into the fall and the new year come check us out, come grab a bite to eat downtown, come try and do business here. It's a wonderful community that uh, we should all be a part of. Well, Dustin, we appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, Tyler. Appreciate it. Dustin McClellan, he is the founder and the CEO of the Pontiac Community Foundation with us today on the Megacast. Find more information about the Pontiac Community Foundation, of course, at PontiacCommunityFoundation.org. Before we take a break, we're going to head back over to CivicCenterTV.com slash coronavirus as uh, Dustin talked about some of the programs that are in place to help uh, residents of Pontiac that are in need of some assistance right now because of the issues that are ongoing with the pandemic. It's taken a financial toll on a lot of people, and a lot of people are still uh, jobless right now as well, and that's not helping uh, because of one of our stories at uh, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus that we didn't, of course, get to in the opening segment of our show. We have a few minutes now to get to it. Uh, 500,000 plus people on jobless uh, uh, who are jobless Michigan workers braced to lose unemployment benefits. This article from Bridge Michigan Magazine, more than half a million unemployed Michigan residents are preparing to lose all or part of their jobless benefits at the end of next week when federal pandemic-related unemployment programs expire. The transition will leave fewer than 100,000 state residents receiving benefits in September, down from a record of 2.1 million in April of 2020. Michigan's Unemployment Insurance Agency, Agency this week notified people uh, notified everyone with active claims to expect the reduction, including the $300 per week enhanced benefit that was included in all payments since March, along with information on how to access job search tools. Those federal programs provided such much needed financial relief to those who experienced job loss as a result of the pandemic, said Liza Estlin Olson, acting UIA director in a statement. Now she said the focus is on resolving outstanding issues at the UIA and scaling back department operations as the number of people receiving benefits decreases as, the week, uh, as of the week ending September 4th. Uh, another quote from Etzlin Elst Olson said, quote, we want to work through any backlogs that we have. We want to make sure that we're taking care of people, of all the people, who we need to take care of, and closed quote. Based on the most recent data from the U.S. Department of Labor and as of the end of July, the changes in Michigan's unemployment will affect about 312,000 people receiving pandemic unemployment assistance, or PUA. PUA is for workers who are not ordinarily eligible for state unemployment benefits, such as self-employed, independent contractors, and gig workers. About 185,000 people receiving pandemic emergency un unemployment compensation, uh, which allows up to 53 weeks of extended benefits after someone exhausts their regular state claim. In addition, an estimated 95,000 people receiving regular benefits will lose the $300 weekly supplement known as pandemic unemployment compensation. Business leaders say employers 
hope to welcome an, many of the jobless workers back into the workforce. Some state legislatures had, legislators had hoped to end the $300 enhanced benefits three, mo three months earlier, saying in June that employers needed them back and that payments provided a disincentive to seek work. Michigan's labor force declined by about 236,350 people in July when compared to July of 2019 before the pandemic, according to federal data. And among those people who are working, 252,310 fewer jobs were filled over the same time frame. Employers across the U.S. have said this year that they're struggling to hire enough workers and businesses fully reopening uh, following as, sorry, as businesses fully reopen following pandemic restrictions. In a quote from Brian Kelly, the president of the Small Business Association of Michigan, quote, people who are on unemployment are not going to have a hard time finding work that pays as much or more than unemployment. The work is there. Lack of jobs will not be the problem, in closed quote. At the same time, advocates for low-income Michigan residents worry about what the change will mean for many of them, especially workers who are not able to return to work due to health issues, concerns about COVID-19 and the Delta variant, child care issues, and for gig workers whose industries have not rebounded. There are not, there are not enough safety nets in place, says Lisa Ruby, public benefits law attorney with the Michigan Poverty Law Center. She continued, workers and their families will suffer both housing and food insecurity. This will impact health and the ability of children to learn and engage in school, especially during this time that they are returning for the most part, to in-person learning, and closed quote. The change in unemployment will affect the state agency, administ agency uh, administrators as well. Complaints about the UI UIA have dogged it since the start of the pandemic as people went unpaid while overwhelmed staff struggled to adapt its controversial computer system to the, to the dramatically higher volume of filers. Wide-scale fraud attempts, slow payments, difficulty resolving concerns, and the resignation of the agency director all feed what State Representative Steve Johnson, a Republican from Wayland, speaking at the House Oversight Committee meeting, called, quote, a pattern of incompetence and mismanagement, and closed quote. Olson, the, the acting director, defended her department during a call with reporters on Wednesday, saying, quote, come walk a day in my shoes and in everybody else who works in this agency's shoes who are trying to get this work done and totally and completely understand that our mission is to pay eligible claimants the benefits they are due. We do that every day, and closed quote. But the number of people doing that work with the UIA declined as outstanding cases are resolved. About 20,000 who have filed what the state calls potentially eligible claims have received no benefits. And Olson said the agency was unable to say when those people would, uh, will hear a determination of their benefits. As of September 4th of, 2000, uh, of 2021, about 50, uh, sorry, as of, after September 4th of this year, about 1,500 contract staff will leave the UIA uh, Olson said, with the limited term staff assigned to the UAA from other departments, just under 500 people departing next. That will leave 650 permanent staff, she said. Olson advised people who made UIA claims to keep an eye on their accounts for up to a year due to the length of time it can take to resolve appeals and other pending issues. That will also give them access to information, quote, in case there are additional issues with their claim, and closed quote. Uh, Olson also continued, quote, we still have work that we are doing for people who are currently there, and close quote. Meanwhile, Olson stressed people with questions and concerns about their benefits should continue to make appointments for online and in-person visits as those will remain available. Michigan's unemployment system has processed 3.39 million claims since the pandemic began in March of 2020, resulting in payouts totaling 38.3 billion dollars. So uh, these benefits uh, very soon are coming to an end. It's not going to be a transitional period where they gradually go away for certain populations of certain people that are claimants at this moment in time. And for many, for many, for thousands of people, it's going to be like a bandage being ripped off and it's going to be, and these are going to go away. So they're going to either have to go back out and like Brian Kelly said, fill many of those open jobs that are out there and are available for people, uh, just if nothing else than to bring in the income that they're not going to be bringing in from these benefits or they're going to be in a position where, like, like others, from, like uh, the attorney from the Michigan Poverty Law Center said, where they are going to be 
in a, in a situation where housing security and food security are going to be a big concern for them on top of not only having to look for a new f source of income, which also can uh, can, can then compound with other poverty-related issues like transportation. So what probably should have been a more gradual reduction instead of a set date where everything just expires, we continue to see more issues amounting with the UIA as they continue to have backlog claims and they continue to be dealing with a massive fraud situation from earlier on in the pandemic and an, an agency that's going to start reducing its staff going forward as well when these issues are going to definitely become more of a problem for a lot of Michiganders. So certainly there's gonna be more frustration and controversy with the UIA as they deal with the unemployment situation during the pandemic going forward. And we'll have more stories on that as they come in, come in at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. We're gonna take a quick break. On the other side of the break, we'll transition from here in our studios in West Bloomfield and go out in the field. And we'll speak to Sylvan Lake, uh, to the Sylvan Tables restaurants, uh, Chris Godolka and Christina Percoli, coming up next. On the other side of the break, you're watching and listening to the Megacast. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. How can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources, call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. to be joined by one of our new favorite restaurants here in our local area in the four communities over in Greater West Bloomfield. Chris Kadolka, the executive chef, and the farm manager, Christina Percoli, join us from the Sylvan Table Restaurant in Sylvan Lake. Chris, Christina, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having us on. We yes, appreciate thank it. You. Appreciate having you guys on. And uh, so the Sylvan Table opened officially, had the grand opening on June 1st. So it's been now a couple of months that you've been in operation. How are things going over there? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Um, it's been a tremendous opening process. Uh, we're almost, you know, three full months in, and it, it's been uh, foot to the floor the entire time. Uh, we, we've been, you know, amazed at the reception that we've gotten from our community and everybody around, um, <clears throat> as well as just, you know, the the, the everyday, uh, you know, spectacular conversations we have with our guests and you know it just it's it's been almost overwhelming and just you know very humbling and you know, heartfelt awesome and this is really a, a special arrangement that you have over there where you're growing a lot of the food and you're cultivating a lot of the food that you're serving to your customers really right on site at the restaurant there at the farm that's right behind the restaurant building over there on Inverness and Sylvan Lake and so that, of course, drew a lot of excitement and a lot of anticipation from the community as you and as you grew toward your grand opening on June 1st. And I know initially after that opening, it was next to impossible to get a, to get a table at the Sylvan table to, to sit down. Has that momentum been sustained over these past couple months or is it becoming easier for people in the community that want to try the Sylvan table to come into your restaurant? So that momentum is still going on. We okay. still see a line at the door uh, every day before five o'clock. Uh, however, um, 
you know, we recommend reservations, you know, for, for dining inside for the tables, but our bar is first come, first serve, and the patio is first come, first serve. Um, so there, there are definitely tables available. Um, it's just, uh, you know, on, on spectacular days like this, there, uh, there might be a, a small wait, um, but it, it's, it's a touch easier than the, the first month, but we're, we're, we do a rolling 60 day booking. So we, we open our reservation 60 days out from today and we're, we're seeing those fill up extremely quick. So it, usually um, anything 45 days and out now is, is pretty well booked or really close to full already. So it's, it's like I said, it's been humbling and just the, the reception that we've received is, is just beyond anything we could have expected. Executive Chef Chris Godolka and Farm Manager Christina Procoli join us from the Sylvan Table restaurant located on Inverness just off of Orchard Lake Road in Sylvan Lake, Michigan. And uh, you opened on June 1st. It's still in the middle of the pandemic, but you took uh, some sp special extra time when, from when the restaurant was ready to be open, the f physical building itself, to when you actually did open to do proper training with your staff, to really go through the processes that you had in place. And then you're opening at a time where COVID-19, the situation was a lot friendlier, as friendly as it can be, than it is at this moment in time. Um, how have things changed since June 1st, given the current situation in terms of your operations at the Sylvan Table to keep those that are coming into the restaurant, those that are seated uh, outside potentially at the restaurant as safe as possible? So we are, we are seeing, you know, some uptick in, um, you know, obviously guest reception to coming in. And uh, we are doing our best to ensure that everybody is still relatively socially distanced. Um, you know, we, we're accepting and accommodating to everybody. We do recommend that people come in in masks. Uh, we make sure that our outdoor seating is available and accessible to anybody who wants it. Um, and then we're following all of the, uh, the CDC uh, Mich and Michigan Health Department uh, guidelines for everything. Uh, we have ensured that our staff is vaccinated. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that's just very important to us. We, we not only want to keep all of our guests safe, but we want to keep all of our staff safe too. Uh, you know, this, we can't do this without the people that are involved. And you know, that, that's something that we find is just the, the number one priority for us. And how about maintaining staff during this time? Because that's also been an issue for a lot of other businesses, especially in the restaurant industry and in retail and, and those kinds of industries. Not only has it been tough for people to bring new staff in, part-time staff, full-time staff, whatever the case may be, it's been tough to retain people. What has set your business apart from maybe others in your industry that is encouraging people to stick around and, and provide the ability to have the staffing necessary to maintain the momentum of your restaurant after its opening in June? So um, a lot of it is the, the location and what we have to offer. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the building. The concept of, of yeah. this project as well. I mean, many individuals are motivated, especially if, if not anything, this pandemic has, has illuminated the food security and sovereignty. And so I think there's a big momentum of individuals who, in the community, especially here, who want to learn more and also support um, projects like this. And so, Christina, let's continue on with that because so much of the focus of this restaurant has been on keeping the ingredients local and keep and really on site in some cases literally where you're uh, where you're cultivating hyper seasonal as it's marked on on my notes ingredients that are used in, in all of your dishes at the restaurant so what is sourced on site and what do you import and when you are importing any other uh, any other food materials where are you looking to get those from especially with your hyper local focus well, growing on the farm currently are a lot of our herbs and salad greens, radishes, tomatoes, eggplants, uh, summer squash, zucchini, green beans. I mean, there's a lot of crops that we have um, that are pulling in right now. And then locally, we support a lot of um, small farms in the area. And Chris can speak yeah. to some of those. Yeah, uh, so we're, we're pulling in uh, produce from Maple Creek Farm in Yale, Michigan, uh, Reroot in uh, Pontiac. Um, we've used fish eye farms uh, for our meats. We're using DeVry's sweet grass. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to keep our, our area to about a 250 to 300 mile radius 
Um, we have pulled some items from Northern Ohio, um, just based on ripening time. Uh, usually that's our, um, our like apricots and peaches. Um, but as the season progresses in Michigan, it, it all switches back over to, to what, what's going on in Michigan. So, you know, I mean, this is, as our guests are coming in and asking us, you know, what, well, what can I expect to see? You know, right now, tomatoes are huge and everybody knows Michigan tomatoes are the best. So this will be the only time of year, you know, until they run out, that you'll see a fresh tomato on the menu. When they're gone, um, we will still have tomatoes, but it'll be what we've harvested during the season that we found a way to preserve, um, you know, through fermentation or dehydrating or sun drying or uh, pickling, you know, in, in some way. And that'll be the same as it is with all of our produce. Um, you know, and that, that gets us through the winter until um, we get our first spring harvests again. Uh, as well as we have, you know, Christina working three amazing high tunnels out there that will be providing, uh, you know, winter greens. Yeah. So I'll be growing for all four seasons. Um, so those tunnels will be in production, typically with spinach and kale and overwintering carrots. Um, but they'll be in production, so we'll still continue to have produce right from the farm during those winter months. We're joined by Christina Piccoli, the farm manager of the Sylvan Table Restaurant and executive chef Chris Gadolka as well. And, and Christina and, and Chris, um, more recently, you did uh, your business did go to the Sylvan Lake Zoning Board of Appeals, hoping to expand the reach of your farm beyond just the plants, but also to have some animals on site so that you can provide some of the, the animal protein as well that's in some of your dis dishes from right there on site. And there's a little bit of controversy surrounding that. There's de definitely a heated debate uh, from that CBA meeting last week and no decision's been made on that, but just to stay as neutral as possible and, and get your perspective from your business uh, to the community that maybe wasn't at that meeting and had just heard through word of mouth through neighbors about what went on there, why now, and why, why at this point do you want to add then animals to the farm uh, uh, there in Sylvan Lake uh, to help benefit your restaurant? Well, animals play a very large role when you're looking at um, uh, land is in whole. So they can offer so much more to what we are doing in a larger scale. So they can prep an area of earth for us, like for instance, pigs root, they help to aerate the ground naturally. It's not uh, equipment that is tilling. Um, their feces is potent and very rich in nutrients. Um, they also help a way of providing uh, for our food waste, our kitchen scraps. So carrot tops that can't be used at the quantity that we're growing. These animals get to eat that rather than it going to a landfill. Because about 24% of our landfills is food waste. And then we also look at our population that is starving. So it's a very uh, big problem. And so we don't want to play a role in that. So having animals is a great way of reducing our waste, helping the soil fertility, and also being an educational access point for the community. They don't have to travel very far to get an experience with a farm animal or a farm. And there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about uh, the food insecurity situation here in the United States, certainly throughout the world, and some of the regulations, not only in the state of Michigan, but throughout the U.S. where leftover food from restaurants or food that is sent back because it's not necessarily satisfactory to the person it's being served to, not being able to be boxed up and be provided to people that may not have access to food. It has to then go into a landfill, so a situation like that would certainly be more prudent to the situation uh, with, with Waste, with food waste than it going to a landfill. That being said, in the end, the board, the zoning board decided it didn't have enough information and voted five to zero to table this issue. The next meeting will be on September 8th and will include a guided tour of the restaurant facilities. It's a really detailed article from the Oakland Press, from our friends over there at the Oakland Press about, uh, about this, and Paula Passi wrote a really nice article about that. You can find that on the Oakland Press's website. So uh, Chris, Christina, just another couple minutes left before we'll say goodbye today. Is there anything else that would be interesting interesting or important for our audience to know or anything else you'd like to say today? Yeah, so I mean, uh, earlier we discussed, uh, you know, the, the hyper seasonality of the menu and that's that's something that we're really focusing on because right now is like home run season for- the Bounty time. Yeah, everything is coming in. So our menu is, you know, getting more diverse as we go now, uh, you know, all sorts of Michigan produce is coming in, you know, and a lot of people don't understand or realize that Michigan is the second most diverse crop producer in the United States, only following California. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's all here and we're gonna be taking advantage of that over the next you know, next couple of months 
uh, as everything comes in. And, you know, we'd just like people to come in and, and enjoy an amazing experience and be able to, you know, experience it with us, so. Chris, you said your reservations open up about 60 days in advance, yeah. and people need to get on that right away. It's still very busy over there. So if they want to make a reservation in advance so they can get in at the Sylvan Table restaurant, how can they do that? Um, so we have our reservation system is set up through TOC, um, which is one of the, uh, the two big reservation sites, okay. and that's all online and or you can call the restaurant. All right, well, we, well, Chris, Christina, we appreciate having you on today. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Chris Godolka and Christina Bricoli from the Sylvan Table Restaurant. One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes. They can be small changes in mood physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you talking. Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith in the studios here in West Bloomfield Township, alongside studio operator Calvin Brown with us each and every day as we broadcast to you about news about COVID-19 and other interesting stories throughout the state of Michigan, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. You can find more information as well as replays on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We're pleased to be joined to, to cap off today's edition of the show by personal chef and recipe creator and food photographer, Megan Gregory. Megan, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So appreciate having you on. Uh, you have a really interesting story of how you got into your current career path. You began working in fashion and did that for about 10 years and then made the transition. So tell us a little bit about your journey from your original career to what you're currently doing today. Absolutely. Yeah, I got my degree in fashion merchandising. I was in retail for a long time. And although I did love it while that season was in play, um, my heart was just telling me that my passion lied elsewhere um, with the hours and the holiday working and the nights. I knew I wanted more flexibility in my schedule. Um, and during that time of just really trying to figure out what is next in my, my journey here, um, I started cooking a lot and just teaching myself to cook from scratch and, and experiencing um, just multiple different cuisines in the kitchen. Um, and from there I started a little page called the Culinary Nest and it was really meant to be a hobby um, just to share my love for cooking and food. And from there, people started commenting and they're like, oh my gosh, that looks so good. Can you come make it for me? And the light bulb went off. I'm like, why don't I say yes? So I started a personal chef service doing in-home dining. Um, I've done up to 30 person events. I went through all everything I should as far as safe six serve um, certified. And really everything has just been taking off from there and constantly evolving. It grew into um, cooking for clients weekly. I am now I'm a food photographer, took all the different classes to get into that. Um, I really enjoy recipe development. So working with brands to um, develop recipes for them or just for fun to post on my page and share with anyone who um, is inspired. And my goal is just to teach you that cooking isn't, isn't really that scary. It's very simple. Just make sure you get in the kitchen, get yourself prepared and um, give it a try. 
personal chef, uh, recipe creator, and food photographer, Megan Gregory from the Culinary Nest, joins us today on the Megacast. And, and as you made that transition and you started the Culinary Nest, and as you said, it was more of just a, a hobby. It's something you enjoyed to do as you, as you were reevaluating your life and, and your career. When did it make that shift from being, this is something I'm doing kind of on the side and something that I'm interested in, to, oh my, I can really turn this into a day-to-day -day career and help people also with their issues with issues in the kitchen and their concerns in the kitchen as well. Yeah, you know what, actually, it happened pretty fast. I would say about three months after starting wow. um, just an Instagram page and posting on there. Um, once I really had that light bulb moment of like, oh my gosh, I actually could do this for a living. I mean, this is a need that people um, have in their lives and um, food is such a common language right it's the one thing that the entire world can come together and say we all eat we all love food um and it's truly an artwork as well so i think after about three to four months it really started after i started putting myself out there i started getting hired and word of mouth spreads and really that's been the best marketing ever it's just happy happy bellies we're joined by Megan Gregory. She's a personal chef, recipe creator, and food photographer. You can find all of her work online on the culinarynest.com. So, Megan, about how many clients do do you regular are you regularly cooking for, and and how how often are you posting recipe recipes and food photography uh, on your website and on your social media? Yeah, so I'm, I'm servicing 15 households a week currently. Um, so making food for them for their, their weeks and um, that is a limited amount of people that I can service, but I try my best to do as many as I can. Um, as far as food photography, I'm really working on typically about one job a week and getting that going. Um, recipe posting, I'm trying to be more and more consistent with that. I do feel like, you know, when you start branching out, I feel like I'm kind of running three different careers between the recipe development and food photography and cooking. So um, posting recipes, I'd say I put out about three to four a month, um, as well as just random tips and um, products I might love, things like that. So I'm always trying to provide some inspiration, whether it's a recipe or something else. So you always have been had an interest in cooking and, and have uh of course made that transition from your previous career to being a personal chef and to putting together these recipes and posting on the culinary nest.com but the the food photography element of it is the it's kind of the outlier in that in that equation how did you get in to food photography yeah so really i mean obviously you want a beautiful cohesive website to showcase your recipes but that really wasn't why i dove in so deep into food photography so honestly that was COVID. that was the moment um that i had a good three month break. We didn't know when we were returning. I wasn't, you know, the grocery stores um, were kind of empty. You didn't know what ingredients you were gonna get and everyone was really, you know, stay at home. So during that time, I'm like, you know what? Now was the time. I, there's not, it's not often that you have just truly that kind of space in your life. Um, so I enrolled in a photography school, um, invested in an actual DSLR camera, the lighting, the diffusers, everything like that. Um, and I've been practicing ever since. Um, pretty soon after getting through that class, I started opening it up that I will shoot for you. I'll create recipes or if you already have a recipe and you're just needing you know, more aesthetically pleasing um, marketing, I'm happy to photograph for you. I also do product photography and I do lifestyle photography. So it's really, um, just keeps growing. We're joined by Megan Gregory from the Culinary Nest. She is a personal chef, recipe creator, and food photographer. So you started the food photography during the pandemic. During the pandemic, that aspect of your career uh, came into play, uh, really due to COVID nineteen, or, or uh, that was where the onset to put that element into your career came into play. How else did COVID nineteen and the pandemic and the experiences of the last year and a half affect your business and in what ways did it maybe help your business also? Yeah, I mean, it definitely affected my business as far as um, my consistent income was, was definitely um, lowered during that time. Um, but it really benefited in a way that I had the time to truly sit. Uh, it's, it was a crazy three years as I built everything with this business and then being able to have that space to say, okay, let's hone in on what your passions are, true passions are. Um, what do you want to grow in? What do you need to practice in? Um, and what other ways can I build my brand um, to make it multifaceted? So it was really beneficial in that way. Um, 
just really settle into into my mind. But I was very excited to get back in the kitchen for my clients as well. We're joined by Megan Gregory, personal chef, recipe creator, and food photographer. You can find all of her work online on the Culinary Nest. Dot com and she joins us today on the megacast and uh, Megan I'm also told uh, in, my, in my notes from our producers that you have a demonstration for us of, uh, of something we do. that you enjoy cooking. Yes, so I am making a Moroccan chicken kebabs over an herbed couscous. So this dish, I love it for summer because you can eat it cold. It involves grilling, um, but it also carries into the rest of the year. So it's something that's healthy, it's really flavorful. You can put your own spins on it anytime you want to and if when grilling season is closed, which yeah, a few more months it will be. Um, you can also prepare this recipe using the oven, just roasting the chicken. Would you like me to get started? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do here is I've prepared my couscous already. Um, what Pretty much you just go by the box instructions. One thing with couscous, I recommend using broth. You can do veggie broth, chicken broth, rather than water, that just already starts to infuse your couscous. So I have that and I have this over here chilling. Um, my chicken, I marinated last night. Um, you really want to marinate this up to 12 hours, but you can just do one. Um, but you do want it to kind of sit in the marinade. What's in here is garlic, ginger, cilantro. There's cumin, chili powder, smoked paprika, a little bit of cayenne, juice and zest of a lemon, and olive oil. So I just kind of let that all marinate together. And what you're going to do, let me put on my my gloves, because raw chicken's never fun to feel. No. <laughs> So we're gonna skewer these up. And um, what I, the way I'm preparing them for this season is on the grill. You just throw it on there for 15 to 20 minutes until it has a nice char. Um, and you want the internal temperature of chicken to be 165 degrees. So you just take a little skewer and let me move this for you. Take a skewer, you're gonna just take your chicken and just start skewering it right on. I would say probably, cause these are a little bit smaller of chunks, um, I'm gonna do about seven to eight pieces per skewer. I'm using white meat here. Um, you can definitely use dark meat. I think dark meat has a beautiful flavor to it. Um, it has more of that fatty content, so it's a really tender piece of meat. But because I marinated this, um, white chicken is going to be really nice and juicy as well. So once you're done skewering, which will look like that, I have already grilled them for you, so we didn't have to spend the time waiting for that. Once you pull them out, they're going to be nice and charred and flavorful. Very nice. So that is your chicken skewers. We're going to set those aside while we prepare the couscous that we're going to put this over. Okay. So on the couscous, I'm going to season this up first. We are going to do a little bit of olive oil just to give it a little bit of moisture in there. We're also going to add some dried cranberries. You can also do dried apricots. You could do raisins, you could do fresh cut apples, um, anything that provides that sweetness, I think would um, blend really well to this dish. We're gonna add some olives. My favorite are Castel Voltrano olives. They're really buttery. They have a little bit more of a firm bite to them um, and a little less of that salty flavor. So I really love these. Um, you could also do Kalamata. You can do whatever you'd like, black, green. So I'm gonna add my olives. And last in here, I am going to add my pine nuts. You can also do sliced almonds, you could do walnuts, you could do crushed peanuts, whatever your favorites are. So we're going to mix that in. And that's kind of like a little pilaf. You're kind of making a couscous pilaf. The, the chicken has so much seasoning on it that I'm not going to add a ton of seasoning to this. Maybe just a little salt and pepper. You always want to season every aspect of your dish. So that is our couscous here. I'm gonna set that aside. We're also gonna do some really fresh, um, just cold, clean toppings. So I have some uh, fresh washed arugula that's gonna go on top. We're gonna slice up some cucumber here. I like doing everything on a little bit of an angle. I think it just looks really pretty. <laughs> so we have some fresh sliced cucumber. I'm also gonna do a lemon wedge on top up here to squeeze over. And really quickly, we're gonna make a lemon maple tahini dressing to go over top. Oh, okay. Four ingredients and we're done. Wow. So we're gonna take this tahini. And tahini is on um, ground sesame seed. That's, that's all 
that um, this ingredient is. It can be a little thick in texture. So um, I'm gonna actually add a little bit of water to this once I get my ingredients mixed together. That always kind of helps just to get the consistency that you need. Okay. So I'm just gonna grab a little tahini. Ooh, this one actually has a nice texture to it. So we might not need as much water as possible. You'll notice that there is oil separation when you're pulling out tahini, that's very normal. So you just wanna mix it together. I'm gonna slice my lemon. I love using a citrus juicer. I think they are an amazing tool in the kitchen. It helps kind of hold your seeds in, gets the maximum juice out of your citrus. I'm gonna put that over, squeeze that in. And the only other two ingredients I'm gonna add in here is a little pinch of salt and a little bit of maple syrup. This just adds a little bit of sweetness because you have the acidity from the lemon, um, you have the creaminess from your beautiful tahini salt, and then your sweetness. It's all about balance in the kitchen. Quite honestly, for a dressing, I would say that this looks like a great consistency. You can see that it's going to run. Yeah. So it will coat your couscous and your chicken. It'd be great to dip in there, or you could just kind of drizzle it over everything. So let's just put it all together. Okay. It's a very simple recipe. I think it's um so fast and easy to make for family. Couscous takes five minutes. Um, the chicken is really fast and easy to put together. It's my bowl. There we go. I'm gonna plate in here really fast. Can you see all right? Yeah, we can there see we it, yeah. Great, okay. So on the bottom, we're gonna add our couscous. Get a nice serving down there. On the side, we are gonna add our arugula. Nice pinch. We're gonna add our beautiful chicken skewers right on top of the arugula. Add our sliced cucumbers okay. and a drizzle of your tahini and you have a really beautiful fresh dish very nice and and, and relatively quick too that was less than 10 minutes that we uh, spent well just preparing that recipe of course it doesn't take into account the uh, grilling time for, th for the chicken there but uh, you have a bunch of these kinds of recipes on your website correct I do, I do. I have a lot of really delicious recipes um, ranging from a variety of cuisines. Um, I can name a few of you that are my top favorites that you'll sure. find on there. Um, I have a beautiful lemon rice soup um, that has been really popular. It's velvety and silky because you actually temper eggs into the lemon juice and then back into your soup. That might sound scary. I promise it's not. It's the most simple technique. Okay. Um, I make Miso salmon over ginger noodles is another delicious one. You just marinate your salmon overnight in some mirin and miso and brown sugar, and it literally falls apart just like candy over this beautiful um, ginger noodle with fresh scallion and serrano peppers and cilantro. Um, I do a sticky chicken, which is a three-ingredient chicken recipe. This is a go-to in the nest weekly. Um, it is just soy sauce, apple cider vinegar, and maple syrup. You pretty much just sear up your chicken thighs, coat it in that dressing, let it go for maybe eight minutes, and that sauce just sticks right to the chicken, and it's phenomenal. Chop it little parsley, put it over some uh, sweet and salty rice, which is also on my website that's used um, coconut milk to make that a little sugar and salt, it's delicious. Um, I also do the ginger, lemongrass, and hoisin short rib, so that just sits in your oven for six hours, makes your house smell amazing, and just fall apart, it's delicious. Um, and a ribolita soup, which is interesting. It's actually a Tuscan soup. I don't feel like you see it all that often. Um, it's tomato based. And what's really cool about it is you actually use um, bread as the thickener. It's not a roux, it's not flour, it's not cream. Um, it's just full of veggies and it's hearty and with fall coming up, I feel like that would be a really great go-to. Well, Megan, we appreciate your time. Thank you for, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Megan Gregory, personal chef, recipe creator, and food photographer. You can find all of her work, as well as many of these recipes, including the recipe that she, that she demonstrated for us today, on her website at theculinarynest.com. Again, that's theculinarynest.com. That's going to do it for today's edition of the Megacast. Got about 90 seconds left in the program. We want to thank everybody that joined us today. Of course, you listening and watching from, from home, from work, and 
all around the world on our website on civiccentertv.com as well as on my Michigan TV. Those listening on the radio on the Biff and on 89.3 Lakes FM, watching us on Civic Center TV and on Birmingham Area Municipal municipal access. We also want to thank all of our guests, Dr. Varun Vora from the Michigan Poison Center, Kurt, Kurt Metzger, the mayor of Pleasant Ridge, for joining us as well, Dustin McClellan from the Pontiac Community Foundation, uh, as well as, as, well as uh, both Chris Kadoka and Christina Percoli from the Sylvan Table, and of course, Megan Gregory from the Culinary Nest. Thank our entire crew also, Larry Nyland, our booking producer and our Zoom producer for getting the guests to come on the show and then also helping them ensure that they get on smoothly and we have a good connection with them each and every day. And same with Calvin Brown over here, our, stu our board operator with me in the studio each and every day from 10 a.m. until 12 noon. If you want to watch this full episode or any of our interviews from today's show or other shows, go to our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And then on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, you'll find helpful information on COVID-19 from the CDC, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and many of our local municipalities, as well as our top news stories. That will do it for us today. Uh, coming up next on My My will be the Steve Latho Show and more great programming on Civic Center TV and on BAMA and our other partners. We'll be back tomorrow morning live from 10 a.m. until 12 noon.